<laughs> okay, I think we'll give it one more minute. Then looks like it's filling up pretty good. And uh, if there's one thing they know by now is that we're pretty on time here. So it's great. <laughs> I almost wish that the in-person ones went as um, on time as the virtual ones do. All right, I think we're gonna get started. So um, welcome everybody to the um, financial session. We're gonna be talking about um, government assistance and government regulations. We have a great panel of people on today. Most of these people, if you're here in BC, should look familiar to you, but I'm gonna introduce um, Jeff McIntyre uh, first. He's a partner at um, MNP in uh, Kelowna and MNP of course is a foundational sponsor of Fortify. I will also let you know that um, Karen is also on the board of Fortify. So we're pretty lucky to have her here as well today. So um, feel free to Unmute yourselves and take it away, Jeff. Okay, thanks, Sandra. Um, first thing I'm going to do is uh, introduce uh, a little more formally Karen and, and Mark Hicken as well, too. And then uh, I'm going to kick it off first with uh, a little uh, a chat on uh, where we're at today with uh, the various government programs that are out there, both federal and BC. And then I'll be passing it off to uh, Mark and Karen for the remainder of the uh, presentation. So first of all, uh, Karen Graham. Karen is a principal at Wine Drops. Uh, Karen has been involved in the BC wine industry since 1998, beginning as a senior staff uh, at a Kelowna area winery, then providing marketing and economic development consulting services to the Canadian wine and, and liquor industry. Um, she launched Wine Drops in 2015 to offer analysis, commentary, and advisor, an advisory on the business policy and regulatory issues that are critical to the future of the BC and Canadian wine industries. Uh, as Sandra mentioned, she's also a member of our organizational uh, board of the uh, Business Alliance for Artisan Fermenters and Distillers, uh, who puts on this conference. Uh, Karen holds a Master of Arts in International Relations, Political Science, and a Master of Public Policy degree. Um, today, she, as I mentioned, she operates Wine Drops alongside her public policy consulting KMG strategy in the Okanagan Valley and also in Vancouver. And uh, secondly, Mark, Mark Hicken from the Vintage Law Group. Mark is the founder of the Vintage Law Group. He provides a full range of legal services to the wine industry. He is also a frequent speaker at wine industry conferences such as Fortify and is often quoted in the media on issues related to wine law. From 2017 to 2018, as many of you know, he served as the BC government's liquor policy advisor. And in that capacity, Mark chaired the business technical advisory panel on liquor policy, which included representatives from various stakeholder groups. And Mark continues to sit on that panel. Uh, so now we're going to, as I mentioned, we're going to jump in and, and do a quick overview of where we're at today with the various uh, government um, programs that are out there. And there have been a lot of them, a lot of new programs this year and, and a lot of changes. So I'm going to jump into that and uh, share my screen here. Uh, just get the right one. And hopefully everybody can see my slides at this point. Not just shout at me. All good. Nobody shouting at me. That's good. Um, so, yeah, I, as I mentioned, uh, it, <laughs> it's been a busy year, obviously, with COVID. And the focus of our uh, discussions uh, today or, or my uh, talk is going to be um, just on running through where we're at with these programs uh, as of today. Um, I think it was Dale Carnegie that once said there's three types of speeches or three purposes of speeches. One is to inform, one is to persuade, and one is to entertain. Uh, unfortunately, this is an informed speech, which is probably the worst of the three. Uh, and you've got uh, a CPA delivering it, but I'll do my best here to uh, keep, keep you moving through what are a lot of details. We're going to keep it pretty high level. Uh, at the end, if you have questions, uh, you know, probably uh, what we're going to need to do if we can't, can't answer them on the spot is um, 
have you email those to me and uh, we'll see that we can uh, do a little bit of research on your half and, and follow up for you because this area is quite technical. Okay, uh, just proceeding with uh, the slides here. So where are we today? Well, as we all know, the pandemic has hurt craft, craft beverage businesses and the economy in general. Um, the government response obviously uh, was, has, been, has been strong and continued and, and fairly immediate in Canada. Um, they provided support to both individuals and businesses. Um, generally, the, uh, the response that we've seen uh, is um, to uh, provide uh, economic stimulus in, um, in the form of a lot of direct grants. The, the philosophy is get money into the hands of the people that need it keep the economy open to the greatest extent possible while, as we work our way through this. Uh, unfortunately, it seems pretty clear now that we're, uh, uh, we're in the midst of a second wave of the pandemic. Um, a lot of action in BC in particular uh, at the end of last week um, to, um, to put limits on social interactions uh, probably affected many of your businesses quite directly. And uh, what we're seeing now is targeted lockdowns and restrictions um, in, in various places and in various industries and economic sectors across the country. So in general, the, uh, the federal government response um, has, has been uh, provided through a number of programs and uh, almost all these programs have been changed or updated or renewed uh, throughout the year and uh, we're awash in a sea of acronyms this year. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's just been quite, quite amazing, uh, quite an unprecedented year and really kind of difficult to keep up with in many sense, senses. Uh, so we're gonna try to touch on the main ones here that impact your businesses for sure. And uh, some of the more recent announcements. Um, first of all, uh, you know, I just wanted to touch on some of the uh, the main federal programs that are um, are, are currently available to uh, individuals. And all those, although those don't directly affect you as business owners, they probably do have an impact on your business businesses employees in terms of what's available for them and what's available for them should uh, they get affected directly by the uh, by the pandemic. So currently, what we have. Uh, is the Canadian Recovery Benefit or the CRB, which is basically the uh, replacement for the initial program, which was uh, the CERB or the CERB as many people called it. I think we're all pretty familiar with that. Um, that program has expired and, and, and basically the government's in a, um, in a position right now where they're trying to um, switch things back to the traditional EI program. And they've also put in place these programs for individuals that might fall between some of the cracks of the current EI program. And, and the overall idea here is, is, is to move away and transition out of the, uh, the, the sort of the sizable uh, direct uh, economic payments that the CERB was providing to individuals. So the Canadian Recovery be Benefit, very simply, uh, $500 per week for up to 26 weeks for workers who have stopped working or had their income reduced by 50%, sort of the same criteria as the previous CERB program. And uh, this is for people that are not eligible for support through the, the traditional EI program. Uh, there's also the Canadian Re uh, Recovery Caregiver Caregiving Benefit, the CRCB. Um, and this is for people who are, um, who, who are affected in the sense that they're not able to currently work um, uh, because they're um, basically acting as a caregiver for a child under 12 years old. So the child's school is closed or the child's asked to self-isolate, needs to stay at home. Uh, there's up to $500 per week support, um, up to 26 weeks in total. <clears throat> Uh, finally, in this area, Canadian Recovery Sickness Benefit, um, same idea here. Uh, we've got a program for uh, individuals uh, who uh, are themselves directly affected. Either they have uh, been diagnosed with COVID or they've been asked to self-isolate. In either case, they're unable to work. Uh, so there's $500 per week for a maximum of two weeks to sort of bridge that 
two week sort of isolation incubation, incubation period. Um, and that's, uh, that program has been extended uh, basically through to September of next year. Hopefully we're all out of this pandemic now and we've all re received our uh, vaccinations by then and, and life is normal. So uh, moving then into the federal programs for businesses, um, just gonna touch on uh, again, the major ones, probably the one that uh, if you're a business owner, virtually all of you have heard of um, is the CBA or um, Canadian, um, I don't even know what that stands for anymore. <laughs> These are all confusing. We just call it the CBA. <laughs> um, so this is the interest-free loan of up to forty thousand dollars, and uh, you know this. This we're we're calling this the part SEBA Part One or One Point Zero is the forty thousand uh, dollar loan. Um, there's two streams to qualify. There's a payroll stream and a non-deferrable expense stream. And basically, what that means is the program initially was predicated on on uh, the size of your of the of your business's payroll in 2019 as reported to CRA. And if you fell within certain payroll parameters, uh, you were eligible under this program. Um, they extended that. Uh, they realized that some businesses were, were not getting caught up in, in or, or were getting excluded out of that program for various reasons. So another way to qualify is what they call the non-deferrable expense stream. So that simply means that um, if, if you have a, a a certain threshold of what they call non-deferrable expenses or expenses that don't go away if, you're, if your business has to close or, um, or, or is uh, down significantly in revenue, um, then you potentially qualify for this funding. Uh, so there's an a pre-screening process that you go through and then you're directed to your financial institution. Um, the big uh, feature here is 25% or $10,000 of the loan is loan receive is forgivable if it's repaid, if the other $30,000 is repaid by December 31st, 2022. The application deadline for this, this first part of the CBA has been extended to December 31st, 2020. And um, the other thing to note here is that um, you, you need to include the, um, the, uh, uh, Generally, you need to include the $10,000 forgivable portion in your business's taxable income in the year in which the loan is received. Um, it is possible to, um, to defer that with an election. Talk to your accountant about that. Very recently, they, uh, they announced what we're calling SEBA Part 2. Um, this is an additional interest-free loan of up to $20,000. Uh, so $20,000 on top of the $40,000 uh, that they're making available. Um, and and uh, of note, half of this additional financing would be forgivable uh, if repaid by December 31st, 2022. Um, and uh, the other thing that they announced very recently, uh, there was some concern, some businesses didn't actually operate a business bank account because having a operating through a personal bank account was generally cheaper for small businesses. Um, they've, they've, they've shored that up now. And as long as you do end up opening a business bank account at your financial institution, you'll still be eligible for this funding. For the second part of this, um, and the details on the second part of this SEBA have not been released. We're expecting them any time yet. Uh, but the, um, we're generally anticipating that there's going to, you're going to have to provide some sort of proof of the impact of COVID on your business, uh, in order to access this addi additional funding. So we'll see what those details are when they come out. Um, I'm just going to keep flying through this cause there's a lot of material and uh, I probably asked Mark or Karen to just chime in and let me know when I'm reaching the end of my allotted time here, cause it, it's going to be easy for me to blow through that, um, but I'm just going to keep keep uh, plugging along here. Um, so, in terms of rent relief, um, there's the SERS. Um, I'm just going to use that acronym, the SERS. Uh, so, there's up to seventy-five thousand uh, dollars per period in rent, mortgage interest, insurance, or property tax relief, um, and that is shared by associated groups of businesses. And there's you know, so that the 75,000 
equates to uh, is, is based on a single uh, premises. Um, and if you have multiple present premises is that your business or associated business is operated out of there's overall a, a $300,000 cap. Um, the, the subsidy method is um, based on the same methodology as the uh, the uh, SUS, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so the same revenue reduction percentages um, with the same 65% maximum for all periods ending on or before December 19th, 2020. Um, so the important thing to note here is that under both the current SUS and the SERS programs, if you've had, if your business has had any reduction in revenue, um, and we'll talk about what the references are there, um, you're, you're still potentially eligible for some funding. And that, that's maybe not clear to a lot of people, but again, if your revenue continues to be down or is down in terms of, uh, the reference that you're using, um, you, you should still consider applying under these programs because you are eligible for something. Um, if, if your business actually gets shut down completely and uh, we're getting dangerously close to some of those situations again with the second wave, um, there's a top of a 20% for the organization uh, in addition to the 65%. Um, yeah, I, I'm not going to go into a lot of these details. Doesn't apply to your residential property, unfortunately. <laughs> these are just business properties. And the rent has to be paid um, to an arm's length um, a tenant or an arm's length lender in, in the case of mortgage interest. Um, so you can't be paying yourself and, and, and uh, applying for these uh, benefits. Uh, so I'm going to skip past that, get into the SUS, which is the, uh, the primary program through which the federal government's been rely, uh providing relief to employers and payroll relief. Um, generally, the original um, uh, portion of the program expired uh, back in late summer and was re replaced and upgraded by what we call SUS 2.0. And we're into that now. And, and the government uh, announced that the uh, program will be extended up to June uh, uh, 2021 at a minimum. And hopefully by then, we don't need it anymore. Uh, basically, up to 85% of remuneration uh, paid in respect of a week for the hardest hit of entities. So if, if you qualify the, for the maximum subsidy, it's up to 85%. Um, these rules are quite complicated. I'm, I'm not going to go into them in detail. Um, but uh, I just want to uh, touch on a couple of things. We talked about the fact that um, for the SUS and for the rent relief program, the SERS, there's no minimum revenue decline. Generally under these programs, I think I have a slide that maybe covers this a little better. Um, just gonna jump, jump ahead here a bit. I think we covered those. Uh, so yeah, the, so the, sort of the revenue comparison that you're doing under both these programs, the SUS and the SERS is you're either looking at a year over year comparison. So you're comparing the, uh, the claim period to the same period, uh, your revenues in the same period of the previous year. And under the alternative method, um, you can look at the January 2020 and February 2020 periods, take an average of those two periods and then compare your co current period there. So that, uh, that might be applicable for businesses which are particularly seasonal in nature. Um, and, um, and, uh, probably doesn't work so well for wineries because you would have wanted to be, um, have a, have strong business revenues in January, 2020 and February compared to what you have now. And that's probably not the case for most wineries, but might've been the case for your, uh, for your, uh, craft brewery business. And here's sort of a summary of the uh, coverage levels under this sort of sliding scale that we, uh, we have in place now for both these programs. Um, so if your revenue decline uh, is 70% or over, you, you've hit the maximum. Um, under the wage subsidy program, the SUS, it's 65%. Um, that's the same as the uh, base rent subsidy. 
And for the rent portion, you can, like we mentioned, potentially qualify for a lockdown rent subsidy of an additional 25%. If you're between a 50 and 69% revenue drop, um, you can see that your 40% plus a formula of the revenue drop and one to 49%, there's the formula that you apply there. Uh, again, long, you know, the, the message is that even if you have only a 1% revenue decline, you're still going to get something under these programs. So I just wanted to take a close, uh, quick look at um, some of the BC government programs that are out there, particularly for the uh, businesses in our industry. And uh, I'm going to touch on a few of them here. So there's something out there called the Small and Medium Sized Business Recovery Grant. And that is intended to be funding to complete and implement a recovery plan. Uh, there's grants of $10,000 to $30,000 available. Uh, this program's going to run till the end of March. And uh, the eligibility criteria, I've outlined the main criteria here. Um, generally, you, if you uh, employ somewhere between two and 149 people in BC for at least four months of the year, uh, you're, you're eligible under this program. You also need to, prior to COVID, have had positive cash flow in your business. Um, so that means they don't want to prop up unprofitable businesses. Um, you need, and, and, and here's the kicker. So this is really for businesses that were extremely hard hit and almost forced to shut down and are on life support. Uh, your experience, you need to have experienced a revenue loss of at least 70% during March and April. So basically you're completely shut down and you continue to earn less than uh, earn 50% or less of your pre-COVID levels of revenue. Um, and and I, I put on my slide deck here, which will be available after the fact, the links to these particular programs. You also need to have access to the programs, uh, you know, that you were otherwise eligible for. Uh, the RRF, uh, the Community Futures Regional Relief and Recovery Fund, um, Basically, I, I would call this SEBA for, for businesses that for, for what, and organizations that for whatever reason might not have qualified uh, for SEBA um, uh, through uh, the federal government's criteria. Um, this is additional funding out there to sort of catch all the uh, folks that slip through the cracks. Um, and that's done through the application process here is through uh, Community Futures. Uh, this one I do want to highlight a bit. Um, this is uh, not a necessarily a COVID relief program, but it's funding uh, for, for uh, BC food producers to receive lean training. And lean training is basically looking at uh, skills that will help increase production capacity, labor productivity, and operating margins of BC food and beverage processors. So there's up to seventy-five, or sorry, seven thousand dollars available for services from a qualified business consultant, and successful applicants are required to uh, pay fifteen hundred dollars up front. Um, so, essentially, pay fifteen hundred dollars and and receive up to seven thousand dollars of funding. Um, to be eligible, you you basically just need to be a food and beverage processor in BC. So I think all our businesses would definitely qualify. Uh, and again, 51% of the direct cost of your products is uh, it, it originate in BC. I think under our licensing requirements, virtually all of our all of our businesses at the conference would qualify. And you need you basically needed to have been an operating business in the previous year, having more than thirty thousand dollars of revenue in the previous year. So you can get. Uh, up to five days of, of, um, of training from a, a qualified business consultant. And I'll do a, just a quick plug here for MMP. We are a qualified business consultant. We're one of the few um, uh, BC uh, or, or firms that practice in BC that is. And I put the, um, the contact email of my colleague, uh, Jay Chen, uh, or sorry, Jay Feng uh, in, in the contact there. Also direct you at MMP's um, virtual booth in the um, in the exhibit hall because we do have a one-page information sheet on this program and we'd be happy to talk to you about that as well too. A good opportunity here. 
uh, definitely that you should consider. Um, just a couple more here quickly. This one I will mention right off the top, the Food Be Business Refresh Program is actually currently full, fully subscribed, but they are taking businesses on a wait list, so I thought I would include it. Um, we're just going to wrap up really quickly here. I can, I can see that um, uh, you can see the criteria there. Um, and the last one is uh, an agribusiness planning program um, where there's some funding available for business coaching. And this is really for startups. So uh, if you're in startup mode, uh, you had less than $30,000 in gross revenue reported last year. This is a good program to give you additional assistance to get up and running. And that's about it. Um, I'm, I'm gonna cut it off there so I don't leave Mark and Karen short on time. So go ahead guys, take over the screen share. <laughs> I think they're ready to go, so. I will stop sharing. If I can figure out how to do that. Karen can just take it from you, it's all good. Oh, okay, great. Hi everyone. Um, so Mark and I are going to um, more or less tag team our, um, our presentation. So we've just got a few short slides, but uh, I thought I would just set it up. Uh, just by you know putting a couple of things in context here, and this is based on what what hearing from earlier this morning and uh, just sort of our our thinking on this. So I mean we've heard already there's a significant shift in what consumers consume, where they buy, how they buy, and how they conceptualize their relationship with their preferred brands. Um, as Kyle Mill, if anybody was on the the opening panel this morning, as he mentioned, you know part of your posi of positioning your business for the future. Uh, is awareness of the evolving regulatory setting. So that's what Mark and I are gonna, gonna speak about shortly. Um, I would argue that in these emergency conditions, um, regulators in turn have a, a responsibility to continue to be flexible and responsive uh, to the tectonic shifts in consumer trends and, and in business needs. So um, earlier uh, this year, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the actual operating environment. So the, the BC Ministry of Attorney General and in particular, the Liquor and Cannabis Regulation Branch, I think, deserves uh, significant credit for its rapid response uh, to support liquor manufacturers and, and hospitality with, uh, with a number of measures, some of which are still in place. Um, we're going to discuss our, uh, our regular regulatory to-do list as well, some things that have not been addressed, um, and give you uh, try to do a little bit of a crystal ball on, on the things that are in place today and what we think might happen um, uh, going forward as far as what they they get to uh, persist uh, into a normal, hopefully post-pandemic normal operating environment or, uh, or where, where just where things are at right now. Uh, so with that, um, I will uh, bring up our presentation here. And uh, so I think, um, Mark, if you would like to take it away with the, um, the, first, um, the first item. Yeah, thanks a lot, Karen. Um, and yeah, I would uh, just definitely uh, emphasize some of the remarks that Karen made about the uh, quick action by uh, the regulators to address some of these issues. Um, you know, some of these things were actually done um, in, in record breaking time. Uh, one of the uh, uh, issues was addressed, I think, within maybe 72 hours of it being brought up for government. So, you know, that sort of response is really appreciated, I think, by industry and really helps so much uh, during this uh, you know, tough time for everyone. Um, so we're just going to run through, um, yeah, some of the changes that were made and talk a little bit about what the future of some of those changes might be. One of the big ones, um, which was obviously very important for the hospitality sector uh, generally, was the move on July 20th um, of this year uh, for the first time ever uh, to allow hospitality licensees, restaurants, bars, and hotels to buy their alcohol products at uh, wholesale prices. Um, this is something that's been asked um, by the hospitality sector for decades, and it's something that is the norm in the rest of the world. Um, so that obviously was, it was under consideration and there was work being done on it um, for the last couple of years as a result of the uh, recommendations of the Business Technical Advisory Panel, um, but that was implemented quite quickly as a result of COVID because obviously the whole hospitality sector was plunged into 
a crisis, a very unwelcome crisis, um, and uh, particularly this issue was uh, seen as a make or break issue in terms of the finances of the sector. Um, so the, that change was introduced and it had some effect obviously for manufacturers because um, prior to the change, um, manufacturers uh, would have been selling uh, their products to that sector at full retail price. Um, so both the government through the LDB and the products that it's supplied through the LDB and the manufacturing sector within BC took a financial hit there. Um, the margin, the, the, the equivalent of the retail level margin, which was going to either the government or the manufacturers, was then uh, lost because the uh, hospitality licensees did not have to pay that anymore. So that was a huge um, benefit for the hospitality sector and something that threw a very welcome lifeline to them, but it did have a financial effect uh, for manufacturers, uh, at least for many of them. Um, prior to that change, there was some ability for land-based wineries to offer hospitality uh, wholesale prices, but um, it was up to them whether they did that or not. Um, I, you know, my expectation is that uh, the the that change is set to be reviewed as of March thirty first, twenty twenty one. My expectation is that, uh, and I'm just speaking personally. This is not supposed to. This is not any um, uh, commentary comment from the. BTAP panel or for government or anything like that. My expectation is that that uh, change will likely uh, become permanent, at least in some form. And the reason for that expectation is that the hospitality sector is not going to have recovered by March 31st, 2021. Um, I think they will continue to need the help. Uh, and this is desperately needed help. And also, of course, this is something that is totally a normal thing in the rest of the world. Um, so I, my, my expectation is that, that uh, hospital, wholesale pricing for hospitality customers will continue. Uh, there may be some adjustments to it, um, but I expect it will continue in some form uh, in the future. And it was also, I will note, um, part of the um, NDP government's election platform. Uh, so I am expecting that to continue. Uh, over to you, Karen, on the next one. Uh, yeah, great. Thanks, Mark. Um, I mean, both of these first two to me uh, seem to be under fall under the heading of uh, it takes a pandemic to uh, <laughs> to bring in some uh, much needed policy reform that uh, that probably should have uh, should be happening anyways. But uh, not that we're not uh, glad to see that it, it coming. So uh, in addition to the wholesale pricing for hospitality, as many of you know and are probably taking advantage of, um, hospitality is able to deliver alcohol with with food orders. Um, that is also a temporary measure. It uh, was extended to March 31st, uh, 2021 as well. Um, and so of course this allows food primary and liquor primary licensees to sell and deliver packaged liquor to patrons with the purchase of a meal for offsite consumption. So this is, I think, a helpful measure. Um, it, it does deliver a bit of a, a lifeline to the, um, to the on-premise uh, oper operators. Um, it's probably still a relatively small share of sales and would likely remain that way uh, in normal times uh, and based on the experience of other jurisdictions. Um, it is just unlikely that the restaurants are going to compete with retail. Um, I think it's a bit more of a, a service uh, to customers um, even if markups are levelized, um, I, I, you know, we allow restaurants to move special products from their seller if there's uh, the, the desire or demand uh, from their customers. Uh, but that's for down the road, probably. And uh, and if, if this regulation is extended into normal times, other, in other words, that it's perhaps severed from the requirement that it be delivered with a food order. So what is the likelihood of this order being extended uh, beyond uh, March 31st next year? I would say hi as well. Um, I, I think along with Mark, I would say uh, given the ongoing projections for dining protocols um, for maybe some still discomfort into the, the spring uh, of diners really rushing back to restaurants, I think uh, the extension of the um, uh, of the provincial authority is is likely to to persist over into next year. The hospitality sector is going to need uh, a significant lifeline for a significant period of time through through 2021, in my view. Um, so over to Mark. Yeah, I agree on that point too. And I would also note too that that's a pretty common uh, thing in the rest of the world for uh, 
restaurants to be able to uh, sell alcohol um, with food orders, um, even without food orders in some places, um, I would expect that to be continued in some form, although there may be limits put on it if, uh, if it is perceived that uh, restaurants are starting to operate more like retail stores. Um, third issue, um, and something that was very important for the hospitality sector as well, but also which became important for manufacturers, particularly with respect to tasting lounges and tasting areas, is what was the um, expansion of the temporary expansion of serving areas, um, and particularly um, fast tracking approvals for um, expansions of patio areas and outdoor areas that could be used as service areas. Um, the, I think the LCRB, again, should be commended for, uh, for introducing that very quickly and for processing those uh, approvals quickly. Um, the one caveat, of course, on that one, um, well, I guess there's a couple of caveats. The first caveat is the weather. Um, and we're getting into a, a time when, unfortunately, this is not quite the uh, lifeline that it used to be because the weather's getting colder. And the second caveat, of course, is uh, mo a lot of times it will also require municipal approval. And there's a great degree of variation between the speed um, uh, of approvals at the municipal level and possible rules that might be invoked, uh, particularly with winter coming. Um, you know, in, in Vancouver, if you happen to get approval to have a um, an expanded service area in a road or on a side street outside your establishment, um, you know, you're not going to be, it's very, it's much more difficult to get approval to erect um, roofs or things like that. Uh, if you're, um, you know, it's probably pretty much impossible to get approval uh, to, 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 to uh, put up more permanent structures to enable those to continue. Carry on here. Um, yeah, so I guess the only thing I would just echo what, what Mark says in, in the terms of um, the municipal authority, uh, the varying um, uh, regimes around the province and in, indeed across the country uh, is, is really where the devil is in the details. So operators should really make sure they're, they're familiar uh, with and in compliance with uh, their municipal or, or regional authority for, uh, for their on-site um, offering. So we will... Just need to Oops, go back to, <laughs> yeah, no, it's okay. I, I did that deliberately. I just need to advance. There we go. That's the way to do it. Uh, okay, so shifting to, um, so we've got five items or six items here in terms of the, the items that, uh, the policies that have been introduced. Um, so number four is the ability to deliver uh, direct to consumer uh, from your secondary storage location. Um, that did expire, to the best of my knowledge, it did expire on October 31st uh, of this year. Um, it seems to me, uh, you know, this, this made a lot of sense, right? So in terms of efficiency of delivery to consumers, um, takes uh, a lot of pressure off uh, the manufacturer, if you're British Columbia based, which is what we're focusing most of our comments on. Um, so it permitted, uh, it gave it issued temporary authority for BC liquor manufacturers to directly deliver uh, to retail customers from a registered off-site uh, storage location. So previously, uh, manufacturers, of course, only uh, allowed to deliver from their primary or on-site um, production location. And so um, the rationale for this uh, was, was uh, put right into the order by the um, uh, by the LCRB. So this new time-limited policy responds to the emergency recommendations put forward by the BTAP. Um, it is intended to mitigate associated negative ec economic impacts on liquor manufacturers. Well, despite the fact that anecdotally and some of the sales data coming in uh, as, as we've seen earlier today and certainly in, in um, other data sources that uh, people are, are not finishing consuming, but nor are we out of um, many of the most important and significant restrictions uh, facing all of your operating environments. So I would say this should be permitted again. Um, I don't actually know that it's current status. Um, Mark may have uh, some comments on this, um, but it just seems to me, uh, you know, this, this should be uh, extended uh, or renewed. Um, however, the only thing I would just add on that is uh, there may be a, a broader role. This, may, this authorization may play a little bit of a broader role in um, a, an ongoing policy discussion in the background with uh, the LDB as far as delivery of uh, 
various items, so non-spec or spec or non-listed items. Um, so it would be nice to have this uh, reintroduced at least so that it lines up with, uh, with the other policy, the, the temporary authorizations um, that, that at least carry through into March uh, of next year, but uh, we'll see how that goes. So Mark, any comments? Um, well, uh, the one thing that I guess I would add on that is that is something, again, that's very common in other jurisdictions, all the West Coast wine producing jurisdictions permit that, um, and there's not really been any issues at all in terms of regulatory issues up or down the coast on that particular issue. So um, I would encourage industry to continue to um, ask for that one and maybe, you know, go through the BTEP process, talk to Miles at BC Wine Institute. Um, and indicate that that's something that's important um, in terms of priorities. Um, uh, I'll move on to the next one. Uh, and current public health orders, of course, this one has been something that um, has been a bit of a moving target over the last uh, months because obviously the uh, provincial health officer and the staff in that office have had a uh, tremendously um, uh, difficult time reacting to um, uh, the pandemic and all of the changes in knowledge that uh, occur from month to month in terms of how the virus operates and what needs to be done to try and control things. Um, there has been some uh, confusion with respect to some of the orders that have been issued um, uh, and particularly with respect to how uh, they affect restaurants, bars, uh, tasting lounges. Um, uh, I put up a, a short summary on my website, winelaw.ca. I won't get into it in great detail here, um, but there's, uh, what I will note is there's a, often a distinction between the contents of the actual legal orders that are issued and the guidelines that are put uh, into place. And so what I try to do on my website is I've linked to the actual orders that are available and the guidelines so that you can look in both places. And obviously the intent is to try and, you know, please uh, adhere to the spirit of the orders, not, uh, I think Dr. Henry said the other day, please don't try and find loopholes in them. Um, but it is sometimes important to know what the orders actually say and what the guidelines are saying and what those distinctions are. Um, uh, one of the things that particularly came up as an issue recently for restaurants was um, whether people could meet in restaurants um, if you weren't in the same household. So if two people met in a restaurant and had a meal, but they were in two separate households. Um, and that is, is obviously an issue in terms of the legal effect of the order and the guidelines that have been issued. Um, so I would encourage people to look at my um, the, the summary that I posted on the website there for winelaw.ca. If anybody has any particular questions about those uh, orders, maybe they can ask those in the chat or the Q&A, um, but there's a lot of details there. Um, and you obviously need to pay attention to those. Karen, do you want to add anything on that? Uh, yeah, just I guess one comment, and that is, you know, anecdotally what, what you hear. Um, so Ian Tostenson's presentation on Friday alluded to this, um, and it's just the really unfortunate impact um, that it's had on, on consumer behavior not being clear on what they should be comfortable with versus not comfortable with in terms of going out to dine. There's nothing in this order that changes how you go out to dine or that you should go out to dine. Uh, just have your mask with you and make sure that you're wearing it between, you know, the entrance to your table. And if you need to go to the washroom, you put your mask on. So, um, so that's all I would say in terms of advocacy there. So I'll just move on, uh, just looking at the time here. So uh, really quickly, number six is, is a little, is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, the, uh, the hours, that were made, uh, extended for um, all retail stores and manufacturer stores, all operators who sell directly. Um, it says uh, at the bottom of, of the written order, uh, and this is the first, this is the only place I think this, this actually occurs in the various orders that are posted on the Liquor and Cannabis Regulation Branches website. Uh, the new policy will re be reviewed as the provincial health context changes. Um, that to me signals uh, that, uh, that this will more than likely be extended, I, I think. so. Um, it is January 31, but it looks to me like they're 
Um, they're very open to this. Doesn't seem like there's been particular issues. On the other hand, noting that um, if you're dining out, you are stopped to uh, serve, or you may not order alcohol past 10 o'clock, although you can walk across the street to the private liquor store and purchase liquor um, until 11 o'clock and then go to a home, which we're now very clearly not supposed to do. So uh, we'll see what happens with that. Um, it hopefully will remain non-controversial. Uh, so moving on, uh, so we, what we've talked about so far are the measures that are in place, uh, some policies that have been changed in response to the pandemic. Um, now Mark and I are just going to relatively quickly cover uh, some reform measures that have been uh, recommended either the Business Technical Advisory Panel in uh, its 2018 consultations and report, uh, or even back as far as the, uh, the Liquor Policy Review. Um, that uh, the previous government uh, held in 2013, brought in a bunch of uh, policy changes in 2015. Uh, there's a few still on the to-do list, and the first of those is, uh, is secondary tasting rooms. So over to Mark to discuss that. Sure, and the one thing that I will mention just quickly in terms of, if, if people actually haven't seen the report in the Business Technical Advisory Panel, it is available on the website for the um, uh, LCRB website. There's a a menu item, something like improving efficiency in government. It's a bit of an obscure description, but if you click on that, you'll actually be able to find that report and you can read through and see all the recommendations. Um, uh, but the secondary tasting room issue was actually a recommendation that was in John Yap's report under the previous government. It was one of the few recommendations that actually was not implemented uh, by the previous government. And that issue was not even dealt with by the Business Technical Advisory Panel because it had already been a recommendation in, in a previous report and was, it was before government. Um, that is one issue that personally I'm very much in favor of. I think that the ability for wineries to have to open secondary tasting rooms, um, you know, along the lines of uh, the situation in Woodenville, Washington, or Healdsburg in Sonoma. Uh, I think that would be incredibly useful for the industry. And I think, again, that that is something that if it's important to industry, um, you know, industry should get together and should uh, go through miles and uh, maybe try to prioritize that as a, something that's important for government to look at. Um, you know, the Business Technical Advisory Panel continues to meet on a weekly basis you know, during COVID. Um, and uh, they, you know, any issues that arise and if there's anything that is important to industry, it gets taken through there. Um, and I know that that's something that Miles is interested in. We've, and, 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 you know, and I think, you, you, you know, industry should talk to him about that and maybe try to push for that. Uh, particularly at the, you know, beginnings of a second mandate of government, uh, there may be some, uh, you know, uh, ability to get some progress on things that, uh, you know, may have been viewed as being stalled. So, Karen? Yeah, my, just two quick comments on that. Um, one is, uh, so just by way of information, and I'm, sh I'm sure many of you uh, may have taken part in this. So the city of Penticton, which is where I'm sitting right now, um, conducted a survey back in the summer of, uh, of, I think, principally wineries. I'm not sure if they also reached out to, uh, to craft spirits, uh, ciders, and, and breweries, um, that there was results of which uh, were broadly in favor, not unanimously, but broadly in favor of, uh, of pushing for secondary tasting rooms. And so I just checked in with the city of Penticton um, in preparation for this. And uh, what they had let me know was that uh, they had wrapped up, rolled up their survey findings and, uh, and delivered a letter to the provincial government um, that, you know, to say this is something that really would benefit the industry. My own sentiment on this is, um, you know, again, it takes a pandemic. If people can't travel to wineries, uh, cideries, breweries, or distilleries, uh, to some extent, why, why can't, um, why not permit the tasting room to come to the people, essentially, in, in larger population centers, lower mainland, southern Vancouver Island, wherever that seems to make sense, or even locally. Um, so we'll leave it at that uh, for now. It's obviously very much still a, a live issue, and I think there's, um, there's probably some industry advocacy, I echo Mark, some industry advocacy that, um, that can and should be done there. Um, so the next two I will cover briefly. Uh, so the review and uh, review and reform of support programs for local products. Um, so in terms of uh, uh, markup exemptions, rebates, um, some of the uh, beverage sectors that don't have some of the same programs that have been put in place for uh, to enhance the development of the BC wine industry. Um, so this is a, probably of keen interest to uh, to many of you today. 
Um, I understand this is in, under discussion in uh, in the background, uh, perhaps among the BTAP and, and the government. So um, Mark may or may not be able to, to speak very much about it. Um, so I would just maybe offer the context of, you know, those who are, are keen to pursue a very similar um, framework to what is in place for the BC wine industry. Um, I would just say, you know, bearing in mind uh, trade compliance, uh, and by that we mean international trade compliance, uh, WTO rules around uh, markup exemptions or rebates uh, that, um, that addresses preferential treatment for local, uh, lo local produce. So not much more to say on that, but just um, be mindful if, if the government is, uh, as you're advocating for this, if, if government seems a little bit standoffish, remember that they just dodged a little bit of a bullet, well, maybe not extricated itself might be better uh, from uh, the previous, um, setting where uh, around wine and grocery. So there's there may be some sensitivities around that, but uh, but keep advocating, but just be mindful of what the what the obligations are of um, of the provincial government on this. Um, similarly, uh, so increased access to government liquor stores for local products. Um, on this, I would actually come back to uh, to a couple of the comments that were made a little a little earlier today. Um, we know that uh, one of the, that the product groups that are doing very, very well among consumers right now are local products. So this is where I would say, um, you know, it, it's, it's behooves regulators um, to be extra responsive to these market shifts, to give people what they want, um, not without being mindful of what framework they put in place, um, but to, to sort of open up to, um, enable their growth. And so what do we mean by that? So I guess in the context of uh, trying to sell to the BC uh, LDB, wouldn't it be helpful if uh, the retail and uh, retail division incorporated a, a buyer for categories such as cider, which, um, you know, by the, the fact that it's uh, for tracking purposes and data tracking purposes, um, nests inside the refreshment category of which it occupies only 5%, it, it can maybe get a little bit overlooked and that's that's probably not appropriate. So these um, these are the kinds of uh, initiatives that just make a lot of sense right now. And I, I think probably the Indus, Industry Association leads are, are the ones that should um, can maybe carry this um, a little bit forward with, uh, with the BC Liquor Distribution Branch. Um, so just the last two points and then we'll wrap up very quickly here. Um, over to Mark for uh, the next point. Yeah, one of the um, recommendations of, in the report was that uh, regulation of the manufacturing sector should be centralized with the LCRB. Um, at the current time, it's sort of split between the LCRB and the LDB. A lot of rules which are actually quite important are contained um, within things like the land-based winery criteria, uh, which is administered by the LDB rather than the LCRB. Um, obviously, um, the feeling of the panel, um, and my personal feeling too, is that it makes way more sense to centralize the regulation at the LCRB. Um, they are the uh, regulator with the statutory authority to regulate the manufacturing sector, and they are good at that, and they have a manufacturing uh, regulation division, that's probably not the right name for it, but, um, you know, which was previously headed by uh, Randy Brown, who I've noticed is uh, in this session, um, and they, you know, did a great job of that, and I think that that's where the regulation should be, um, and, uh, you know, that hasn't happened yet, and I would, I am hoping that, it's, you know, at some point in the future that will happen, because I think that that's important to get it centralized in one place with people who are very knowledgeable about the manufacturing sector and how things work, and obviously you're much less likely to have problems with regulation and audits and things like that if the people who are making the decisions and doing the regulation actually understand how the manufacturing works and they understand the processes. So I think that that's something that's important as well. Um, Karen, just in the last one there, licensee to licensee sales. Sure, thanks. Yeah, I'll just, uh, I'll just do this really quickly because I know we're coming up against very limited time for questions. So this was one of the other uh, recommendations um, in the BTAP report. Um, I certainly, when I made my submission uh, and in the preceding uh, 2013 process, uh, this just seems to make sense that hospitality uh, businesses should be able to order and purchase their, uh, their beverage alcohol from uh, other 
uh, private operators. It, it, um, so I think that the, the, the door was opened a tiny bit to this. Uh, I don't know if Jeff Guinard is still on, but uh, when he uh, interviewed David Eby at uh, the, the BC Liquor Conference back before the end of October, uh, before the government uh, uh, gained its majority mandate. Um, David Eby was uh, was remarkably candid on this point, and it sounded to me like this is something that they that the analysis is underway on, and uh, that if they were to reform government, which they have, that this is something that um, that the attorney general would take a really good uh, look at and, and perhaps uh, bring it bring it in in some format. So my own view on this, uh, it can be done in a way. That, uh, that still remits tax revenue to the treasury. In other words, the government is made whole, um, but allows smaller or specialized real, re, re, retailers to get a boost from, uh, in terms of orders from free primary establishments. So immediate benefit to on-premise uh, should be pretty self-evident, uh, more conveniently available product with fewer administrative steps and, and delays. One thing that I would add to that is obviously manufacturers would probably rather be selling their product directly, directly. to uh, the hospitality sector than having them go to retailers to buy it. Um, the, the request really from the hospitality side is more in line with we've run out of this product, we just need to go get a couple of bottles. Um, and there could be some you know, guardrails put around it uh, to uh, accommodate those concerns. Anyways, so that, that's, I think, pretty much um, we, we raced through some of those items and people may have questions. And if anybody has any questions or, um, you know, put it, put them into the chat or the Q&A, um, I'm it. more than happy to. one here that's been there. So I will, I will put that one out. Um, and I'm pretty sure that Mark, you're not going to be able to answer this. So we might have to put it to Karen. Um, it's from Al Hudak. He's a disturber of sorts, but any case, um, I'm starting to wonder whether <clears throat> the interests of liquor manufacturers are best served by BTAP. Growth and expansion of retail channels is good for manufacturers, but resisted by BTAP on behalf of existing retailers. Examples include extension of the moratorium on LRS, proposals to limit restaurant takeout and delivery to prevent the growth of bottle shops, and prohibition of secondary co-op tasting rooms. Any comments on that? Well, I mean, I can make a general comment. Um, you know, I think actually that the interests of the manufacturing sector are pretty well represented through the BTAP process. And I think the BTAP process has actually worked quite well. Um, the Government is definitely listening to industry in a way that I don't think I've seen that happen before in the past. Um, uh, and that certainly was the case with respect to rapid response on a lot of these COVID issues. Um, and I, you know, unfortunately, the wheels of uh, government move slowly no matter what the lobbying process or the, you know, consultation process is. And obviously it would be nice if things move faster, but, uh, you know, and I'm biased somewhat because I used to be the chair and Jeff is now the de facto chair, I think, as he mentioned earlier. Um, but I think the process is actually working quite well. All right. And of course, uh, Randy Brown, we have like 30 seconds. So do you know if there are any international trade issues or agreements that would prohibit the secondary tasting rooms or is this a retail channel protection issue? I can, I can take a little run at that. You're like 10 seconds. So. On the first part, Randy, I would say a, a little bit of both. Um, the Americans have noted uh, the secondary tasting room issue in across in very in other provinces. They have included that in their briefs that they have filed. Um, for the WTO channel, uh, challenge. They didn't make a challenge on that basis, but it is considered, I, I think there would be, they're watching it, but on the other hand, you know, pot calling the kettle black, obviously, right? Um, some of the best examples of secondary tasting rooms are in Washington State and California, as Mark mentioned. Yeah, I mean, what I, my, my only comment on that would be secondary tasting rooms are permitted uh, in nearly all other jurisdictions and, and, and they all down the West Coast, they're permitted. In Washington, I think you can have four <laughs> secondary tasting rooms. So I, yeah, uh, that's my, my quick comment on it. <laughs>
All right. Okay. We have a couple of questions on there for Jeff, but um, Jeff, if you could say out loud your email address and then people can send them direct to you. Sure. That'd be great. Um, so if you can see my name down in the uh, lower left-hand corner of my Zoom box there, uh, just put a period in between jeff.mcintyre at mnp.ca. All right. And we will see everybody in 15 minutes. Sorry, I had to kick you all out, but it's pretty tight on this one. So make sure if you didn't get Jeff's email on that one that you email me and we'll make sure that you get in contact. Okay. I really appreciate you guys being on today. You did an excellent job, a ton of stuff to cover and a very short little timeline. So thank you, Karen, Mark, and Jeff very, very much. Thanks, Sandra. Thanks, Sandra. Thanks everyone.